What's up everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. John Tam and in today's video I'm going to talk about the six most common PhD to industry transition mistakes that I've seen. And I've helped PhDs make a transition to industry, especially those PhDs with social science and humanities degrees. And as part of my research for this PhD to industry transition, I've interviewed over a hundred people from career coaches to PhDs who are struggling to make a transition to PhDs who have made the transition. And also it helps that I've made this transition. The last thing I guess would be because I'm a hiring manager myself. So in today's video, I'm gonna cover the six most common PhD transition problems that I've seen. So without further ado, let's get started. And definitely stick around for the sixth one because that's gonna make all the difference in the world. Well, the first problem that we've seen is lacking clarity. And what I mean by that is oftentimes PhDs are segregated essentially in an academic system and they spend a good five to 10 years of their lives in that system. And what that means is a lot of times they become somewhat detached from reality. They don't know what the outside world is like. Of course, there are those programs where the PhD program is connected to industry. And in those cases, those people have a much better time. But oftentimes, in the social sciences and humanities, which is primarily where I'm coming from, a lot of them do not have that connection, right? You're not gonna have an industry connection in the humanities, it's just not a thing. So what happens is they go online, they do their research, whether they go on LinkedIn and they see some generic career coaches advice on how you have transferable skills or how you know one person has abilities to go to any other industry and so on. Well, that advice doesn't always apply to PhDs. And the reason for that is because when you are a PhD, you are at a point in life where you're probably gonna be specialized in something very, very well. You're not a fresh college grad graduating from a generic social science or humanities program and you can kind of fit in into whatever entry or junior role. You're coming out as an expert in research and you're probably gonna fit in some kind of IC role, which is an individual contributor role. So the first thing that you gotta do is to gain that clarity. And so how do you do that, right? Well, you gotta conduct information interviews and you can check out the playlist that I have above that teaches you how to conduct informational interviews. And for that, I would recommend you to speak to people who have made the transition, fellow PhDs who have gone through that process. They will know what kind of skills that PhDs in academia have and what they can bring to the table once they made the jump because they have made the jump themselves. Another thing about clarity is you gotta be able to narrow down your job into a certain role, right? And specifically a title. So a common role that social science PhDs have entered are those in UX research because essentially it is applied social science research. You use the same scientific method except you use it in an application kind of sense. And so that's where a lot of PhDs have gone recently. And right now, as of the filming, it's 2023. So a lot of these jobs have been cut in the industry. But prior to that, in the last five to 10 years, has essentially been a golden age in UX research transition. That may yet come back, we don't know. But as of now, a UX research role is kind of a no-brainer jump from PhD in the social sciences into industry. Another thing is, if you're in the humanities, perhaps a role in communications or a project manager, those would be some roles that are a good fit for the skill set of someone coming from the humanities. However, the main thing about clarity is you got to figure out what it is that you want to enter and create a profile, a portfolio, a resume for that specific role. And this brings me to my second point, FOMO. A lot of PhDs make the mistake of FOMO, the fear of missing out. And the reason is because they're like, oh, I have transferable skills that allows me to go into US research. I also have transferable skills such as writing and critical thinking that allow me to go into a project manager role or communications role or so on. So as a result, you make four or five or six portfolios, LinkedIn profiles, resumes, and so on. And honestly, no one's got the time to do that. It's such a drain when you go on LinkedIn and you gotta look at all the different job titles that's on the market right now and then apply to them and then tailor your resume to fit that specific role. And perhaps the biggest problem is if people look you up on LinkedIn and you're applying for a UX research role but you decide to tailor your LinkedIn profile that week to be a project manager, you're gonna have some questions. Like people are gonna be like, why should I hire them? This person is not even committed to the UX research role, right? So the key about FOMO is 
pick a path and stick with it. There's a Confucian saying that says the person that chases two rabbits will not catch either of them. And that's really what the job search process is. The more FOMO you are, the harder it is to land a role. Pick something and stick with it. And in order to do that, you really got to do the first step, right? Get that clarity and speak to the people in the industry to figure out, are you a good fit for it? What's a skill set that you need and so on. And this would also allow you to focus upskilling properly. In my case, I figured out I want to go into games and I just read all the books about games user research and I doubled down on it. I speak to people in games user research. I interviewed for those roles. I got reps at those interviews and I figured out, hey, what are the answers that they're looking for? What are the craft examples that I'm going to receive and how should I tailor my efforts in answering those questions? Over the three to four month process, what happened was I got enough interviews that I figured out how to troubleshoot each step of the way to make this transition. So don't fall for FOMO, pick something and stick with it. The third mistake that I've seen a lot of people do is they're missing the jargon. They're missing the signaling that they belong to a certain industry. And going back to my own example in games user research, usability testing and play testing is essentially the bread and butter of that field. However, that may not necessarily be the case in the more general UX research sort of sense. And therefore, you got to figure out what direction you're going to. You're signaling that you're the right type of fit for that kind of role. And not only is this in the interview process, but also it's got to be in your LinkedIn. It's got to be in your resume. It's got to be in your portfolio. If it's asking for a portfolio, you really got to figure out what path it is that you want to take so that you're signaling the right things. And you can only get that from socializing with other people who are in the industry. And when you're reaching out to these people, don't think that you only have to reach out to, in my case, UX researchers. You can also reach out to designers, market research, communications, in leadership, in management. You can just reach out to a whole bunch of people in that industry to absorb that culture and those words. So in the case of games user research, people are super casual. And if anything, one thing that I had to adapt was when I entered the industry was to be less buttoned up. The fourth mistake that people have, and it's also related to everything that I've been talking about so far, is targeting. You gotta be able to target industries that are actually hiring for PhDs. A common problem that people have is that they go on the LinkedIn board or the Google job board and they apply for every job that they see on there um, that they feel might be a certain fit. However, certain industries do not hire PhDs because PhDs inherently suggest a lot of biases. And in order to address that, you have to figure out, hey, what are the industries that are open to PhDs? Have any place already hired a PhD and what you can do is go on LinkedIn, look at their company and see, hey, does anybody in there have a PhD based on that title and role that you're looking for? Doing some of that legwork would help you have reasonable expectations. And after some time of doing that, what you're going to see is there are certain patterns and in industries that would hire PhDs and certain industries or companies that will not hire PhDs. I don't want to say like only big companies hire PhDs, but for the most part, my understanding is that a lot of big companies have had PhDs make that jump and have found that hiring PhD gives a pretty decent ROI. However, if you apply to smaller companies, they may carry biases towards PhDs because they don't understand them or because there was no previous PhD that has brought a lot of business value to the organization. Doing that legwork and figuring out, hey, which industries, which roles, which companies are hiring PhDs is essential. And that way you can target your efforts more effectively. A fifth common mistake that I've seen is not overcoming biases. As a PhD, that's a terminal degree. I think only about like one to 2% of the whole America. And by being a PhD, you also self-select for a number of traits. Now I'm not saying that all PhDs are like this, but there are several things that, you know, researchers share in common, right? They tend to be a little bit more introverted. They tend to focus on the details. They tend to be very critical and they tend to be very good at studying, which would suggest several things, right? You, they're probably too book smart for their own good and they don't have the good social skills to back up the day to day. They might be too theoretical, too pie in the sky and they're not grounded in reality. They might be coming from academia and not understand what the business world is like and how you need to use research for business purposes. Or they might just think you're awkward because you're a nerd, right? A PhD would basically be a nerd and by that, you probably have poor soft skills, right? Now, I'm, everything I'm saying right now are stereotypes and biases. I'm a PhD myself, and I don't think I fit in those things. And maybe I do have all these problems and I'm just not self-aware, who knows? But the bottom line is this, 
people tend to have biases towards PhDs and you really got to show it in the interview process that you do not have these issues. So typically when people hire people, they look at the why, the how, and the what. Um, why should we hire you in terms of like the mission? Do you align with the mission? Do you align with what we want to do? How do you fit? right, in terms of the chemistry with the rest of the team. Will you get along? Do I see myself working with you on a day-to-day -day basis? And three is the what, what do you bring? So usually the what is not an issue for PhDs. People know that you're super smart and you can do research and have critical thinking and so on. The why is kind of like a more fluffy thing, more superfluous fluffy thing. And they're like, okay, do you align or not? It's really hard to tell because in an interview, anyone would say like, yeah, I align with your organization's mission. Everyone would say that, right? So whatever, you know, you pay it the lip service. But the second thing, the how, it's kind of like, well, do I like you? Do I see myself working with you on a day-to-day -day basis? These are the problems that PhDs have to answer in the interview process. So make sure you overcome these biases and show that you're able to signal that you belong. And these are the pieces that's important. And the sixth and final thing is landing in the wrong place, right? This is a very common mistake that I've seen some PhDs who successfully make a transition and land it in a almost six figure role at a senior level. And the organization eventually felt that they were not a fit. And essentially they were not able to pass probation or they were, they were let go very quickly. Um, within within six months sort of thing and the reason is PhDs are very competent people you're able to do a lot of research and some people are able to follow everything that I'm talking about here and at the end of the day if you make the jump just because you want to make a jump and make more money which is totally understandable because academia for the most part pays like crap for postdocs and adjuncts and so on like a lot of people just want to make the jump right and after you make the jump what happens is that it's not a good fit right and if it's not a good fit over time, it's going to show and over time, you're not going to be happy. And over time, you just have to start from square one again. Now, mind you, going back to square one is better than not making a jump at all ever, because at that point you can say, hey, I got industry experience, right? But it would also bring questions about you. It'll be like, hey, you started in this company for three to six months. How come you're on the job market again? what went wrong. It will raise a lot of red flags and it will actually introduce more problems than solve them. Now, mind you, there are ways to solve those problems. So it's not the end of the world. If I was to make a recommendation is I would say that make the first jump possible outside of academia, get a first industry job, and then you can, you know, kind of figure out your path from there on. But if you have that clarity piece at the very beginning, at the get go, it would save you a world of hurt because it's, yeah, no, no one wants to deal with going on a job market again after landing something for three to six months, right? So you just got to be very aware of this process and have that clarity at the very beginning. And that's it. Those are the six most common mistakes that I've seen people with PhDs who transition industry make. If you know other mistakes, please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear more. And let me know if this video was of use to you and if you got any value out of it. Uh, leave a comment if you got any questions and give it a like and subscribe if you have not yet. Peace.